It's evident that he cares. What do you care about? Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show. It is a parasitic social system. Would be no capitalism if there had been no slavery. Slavery was the first big business in the world. Good day and greetings to my YouTube family and to all others who would be looking at the Rock Newman Show 2.0 today. As you might note, notice, this is the first time that we have done a remote broadcast um, for Rock Newman Show 2.0. So again, I welcome you in. I hope that you would call family, friends, and anyone else in your sphere of influence. As today, I think we have a critically important uh, show and subject matter to cover. Um, we have a guest who has been in the struggle for freedom, for our people, for a very long time. His name is... Omali Eschatella. Sir, welcome to the Rock Newman Show 2.0. Thank you so very much. I'm happy to be here. And like I told you before this, this show began, the last time I saw you, you were slapping a very big guy in the corner of a boxing ring. So <laughs> thank you. It's good to be here. I guess that might be a symbolmatic of... <laughs> We're not afraid to take on uh, right big, on. big challenges. Right on. <laughs> that might be something <laughs> you and I both have in common. <laughs> Thank you. So there are, with your history and current situation, there are so many places to start. I looked, I looked, I, you know, in doing my research, I was like, where do I start? It was very difficult for me to... Uh, come up with the with, with the first question but i i, I want to try to tackle it this way when i was 17 years old in my senior year in high school in 1969 somewhat conscious during that time i'd gone to a couple of black panther meetings i was truly a Muhammad Ali disciple. And an occurrence took place in Chicago that I thought then, and I've thought for all of these years, that was a diabolical murder at the hands of the U.S. government when the chairman was, was, was slaughtered in the bed with his queen. I start there because more recently, last year, your home and places of residence, other places of residence and offices were raided by the U.S. government. And to start with, I would like if you would compare, contrast, correlate the experience that Fred Hampton and his ha family had to the experience that you just went through in these last months. Well, first of all, thank you. I think it's an extraordinarily important question. I think it's an extraordinarily important observation that you've just made. Uh, because uh, on July 29th of last year, uh, when my home was attacked by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, when uh, my wife and I pre dawn were awakened at five o'clock in the morning, uh, pre dawn, and uh, commanded uh, by loudspeakers from outside uh, to come out with our hands up and nothing in our hands. And when, after having heard that, these loud explosions uh, began to go off around the house, and uh, we were to learn in the back stairwell of the house, uh, smashing plaster and things like that uh, on the wall. And when I did come downstairs with my hands up as they commanded, uh, I was greeted by 
uh, a military force, uh, at least, well, more than a couple of platoons of forces. And I call them like that because while they characterize themselves as the FBI, uh, they were dressed in military outfits. They had on flag jackets and they were armed with assault weapons. And these assault weapons had mounted on them uh, these uh, laser targeting devices. And when I walked out the door, these devices, dots all over my chest. And so it was clear uh, that they were letting me know that they were prepared to kill me. And the first thing that came to my mind, of course, was what had happened to Fred Hampton uh, at four o'clock in the morning when they raided his house uh, with the assistance of the FBI and they murdered him in his bed while he was eight months pregnant. His wife at the time, her name was Deborah Johnson. It was to become, uh, in, uh, it was to become a, a cool and Jerry. Uh, she talks about how uh, the FBI, uh, they shot through the, the FBI influenced and organized and orchestrated uh, military force of the Chicago Police Department, working with the district attorney there. They shot through the wall on the other side of where she was asleep uh, after having killed uh, uh, Mark <coughs> Clark uh, uh, coming into the place. They shot through the wall. And she talked about how the bed she and Fred were sleeping in was vibrating some from the bullets that were coming in. And that she tried to awaken him and she couldn't awaken him because the, 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 they had previously, an FBI informant had previously drugged his drink so that he was helpless in his bed. So they come at four o'clock in the morning uh, on West Monroe in Chicago and kill Fred Hampton. And this is what's going through my mind as well when I'm coming downstairs. And when I, after I get downstairs, my wife is following me. I've asked her to stay and tell everybody, call, get on the phone, tell them we're being raided. And uh, she tried to do that, but they had blocked our phones. The phone company is working with them. They shut down our phones. Uh, and when she uh, exited the house following me, she was met as she was exiting. She was met uh, by a drone uh, that went past her head uh, going up into the house. And, and at the same time, these flashbang grenades are going off all around. They've blocked off the community. They've occupied the, the, the porch uh, of the people who live next door. They put uh, tape over the ring uh, video, the doorbell video to make sure they couldn't be observed from that, that location. And, uh, and then they held us at gunpoint and they, they, they zip tied me behind my back. And my wife, she gets downstairs. They put handcuffs on her behind her back. Uh, the entire community is roped off. Uh, and, and, you know, after the murder, the murder of Fred Hampton is one of the things that uh, let anybody who was in the movement at that time uh, know what the government was capable of doing if we hadn't learned from what they did to Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and yeah. ad infinitum. Uh, this yeah. was clearly something that was on our minds. We knew it could happen. Uh, uh, so uh, it, was, it was not surprising in that regard. It was surprising that it happened. When it happened, uh, uh, it was a shock and awe kind of uh, thing that they had initiated against us. So it was very serious. Did did was had a warrant been issued for that action? Well, what we were told, uh, I'm finally through really harassing the cops because they wanted us to sit on the curb. It's a really humiliating thing that they wanted to do. They wanted us to sit on the curb. You've seen the pictures of them do this before in the communities. Uh, uh, I say them, I mean the police, et cetera. But this instance, the FBI wanted us to sit on the curb, and uh, which we didn't do. And uh, uh, so are we... We, I'm asking them, what's going on? Why are you doing this? And they said that uh, there's a warrant that's going to be uh, issued uh, later this morning uh, uh, for uh, against a uh, not a warrant, but a, but an indictment against a Russian agent who's age, uh, a Russian uh, who's in Russia. They're a Russian national who's in Russia. Should he come to the United States, they're going to do something to him. Uh, but my name was mentioned. They said uh, in the indictment. So I said, show me the warrant. They said, well, I can't show you the warrant because it hasn't been issued. And that's going to be issued later on in Tampa, Florida. Uh, uh, so uh, they said, uh, based on that, we have a search warrant to enter your house. So let me see the search warrant. They said, well, let's hear someplace. I, we don't have it right on hand, but somebody in the area has it and we'll get it to you later. In the meantime, flashbang grenades are still exploding all around the place. 
And uh, so uh, uh, I'm I'm struggling to get out of there. They, they said you can sit in the back of the car. I'm I'm, I'm zip tied. They said, or someone really kindly came up and said, well, you can come sit up in the house and and not move uh, while we do what we're going to do. And I'm definitely not voluntarily going up in that house with them uh, while this is going on. So I said, no. I said, are we under arrest? No. Can we leave? Yes, they said, finally. So uh, we got uh, the the keys to my vehicle and we left. And as, after leaving, then we learned that they had done the same thing uh, uh, to uh, our office, an office that's in, in, in South uh, St. Louis, which is the majority white community, as opposed to where we are now. I'm in uh, living in, at this moment, in one of the most impoverished sections of St. Louis. That's what they've attacked now. So, uh, but over in South St. Louis, they have attacked the Solidarity Center. The Solidarity Center uh, is occupied by, by mostly uh, white people who work under the leadership of the black movement, who do basically reparations work, who take this struggle out into the white communities. It's, it's been one of the ways we've broken out of the historical encirclement that they have imposed on the black liberation movement when we take it, open up another front in the white community around black power. So they've gone to that center. Uh, we captured some stuff uh, through security videos that they knocked the doors in, they used battering rams, they knocked down steel doors with with battering rams, they come in with the explosions again there, and, and then they go to the apartment above, and there are two young uh, uh, white people who work uh, uh, in the uh, Uhuru Solidarity Movement. Uh, they handcuff them uh, and hold them at gunpoint. In every instance, including at my house where they've broken windows, they've broken in doors, they, they, they steal, they loot uh, things like cell phones, like, like, like laptops, uh, iPads, you name it, and they did the same thing at the Solidarity Center. They went to the home of, uh, of two other uh, of the people who work in the Solidarity Movement, held them at gunpoint after knocking down the doors, breaking windows and things like that, looting their, their cell phones, all this kind of equipment. And then in St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, where I was uh, organizing from uh, as well, where we have a, a, a Nuhura house as well, they went to the Uhura house there. They used battering rams. They knocked down the doors. They, we, we, they took our radio station uh, temporarily off the air. They went upstairs at the Uhura house. They, they ram, uh, ransacked our uh, archives where we've got 40, 50 years of materials of the history of the movement. Uh, they stole stuff from there as well. And then they went to the home of uh, one of the young leaders of our movement, who's also an unindicted co-conspirator, they, they used the St. Petersburg, Florida Police Department, told her that someone was breaking into her car, that she should come outside and investigate. When she comes outside, then she's surrounded by FBI agents, take her cell phone, and et cetera. So this is, this is sort of like the scenario uh, of, of what, what transpired uh, on that July uh, Friday, July 29th at 5 o'clock in the morning here in St. Louis and 6 o'clock. Uh, uh, in St. Petersburg, Florida, Eastern Time. So <clears throat> in the, in, in preparing for this interview, uh, you know, I read as, as much as I could about the circumstances. Right. And I'm going to say that the, what's quoted in, I think it was the Tampa paper, one of the Tampa papers and, and, and St. Louis papers also is the claims that were made by the government. Yes. And I'm going to take the liberty to editorialize here for a moment. Um, I I called a um, a, a highly respected social science professor to talk to him about what happened. And his response was that all of it was total bullshit. <laughs> that, that, was his, that was his response. Um, you know, I looked through something and when I say I'm gonna editorialize, I kind of wanna do it here. And that is one of the claims that they made that the FBI made was that um, 
you that you, you were directed to uh, help influence the recent campaign uh, 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 campaign uh, uh, the, during the political season. You were directed to use the issue of reparations. <laughs> and you were directed by a Russian to use that as a gimmick, as a tool, as an influencing subject. So I want to say to the FBI from the seat that I sit in that in case you don't know, uh, Brother Eschatella was one of the, if not the original person in the United States in 1982, and if I, my math is right, 1982, and then you come to 22, 40. 40 years ago, bringing up and calling for reparations of people of African descent in the U.S. So that particular claim is one that you can stick it where the sun don't shine, FBI. I, I'm just talking to the FBI. Now, now, I don't know all of the particulars. I don't know all the evidence that the FBI has. And maybe some of the other evidence and maybe some of their claim they think really are legitimate. You might get charged with that. If you get charged with that and found guilty, you as an 81-year-old man are, you know, yeah. Would, would, would more than likely be sent to prison what could possibly be for the rest of your life. Yes. But that particular charge, that just stands out to me as the utter, as utter hypocrisy, overreach, insanity. Your response. Well, it's true. And the fact of the matter is, as you just mentioned, in 1982, we held the first tribunal uh, um, reparations for African people in this country. It was the World uh, uh, Tribunal, International Tribunal. We had people who were in panel as uh, international jurors. And uh, it's also interesting that this was based on international law, this tribunal. And part of the international law that we based it on was the United Nations Convention on the uh, Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, uh, which was something that uh, happened in United, uh, United Nations in 1948. It's now uh, at that time, 1982. And while much of the world had ratified that, the United States had, 40 years later, had not even ratified that convention. So we, we uh, brought that up as part of the evidence of genocide the United States was committing against African people, the fact that African people were owed reparations in 1982. Uh, and I think it's really important to say that because one of the other things they claim is that uh, we uh, participated in a four-city uh, tour uh, where the United Nations uh, had forces traveling throughout the United States uh, investigating the conditions of African people. And we traveled with them. It was in the winter. We call it a winter campaign. Uh, and uh, every place they went, we went. We spoke in as many instances as we could uh, uh, to these open forums that they had provided for people to speak at. And uh, we were initiating a process of collecting signatures on petitions uh, that people could sign, uniting with the, with the uh, demand that we were making that the United Nations should look into the genocide against African people according to the United Nations Convention. Not according to something we made up, but the United Nations had passed this. This was international law that we were looking at. Yeah. So what they have said, they have said is that the Russians paid us to do this. They stole 130,000 signatures on petitions that we had collected on, on this, uh, what is it called, change.org or something like this. 130,000 signatures have been collected over, over a few years, which was sufficient to have gone to the United Nations with it, just in terms of the weight of the numbers. But they stole that. They said the Russians paid us to do this. In other words, they don't have to deal with the question of whether genocide is being committed against African people. Uh, all they got to do is say that people who complain that that's happened uh, uh, are actually agents of the Russians. There's nothing wrong with the United States. There's something wrong with black people 
who say that something is wrong with the United States because we are working for the Russians. So they dismiss the question altogether. They don't have to deal with it. And it's really striking because this is the very, quote unquote, liberal, uh, quote unquote, anti-racist compared to the Trump all right, uh, regime that we're looking at. Uh, and, and the anti-racist Democratic Party compared to the quote-unquote Republican Party that we're looking at, and that they would make this, this most racist trope, they would most racist trope that Africans are too stupid to know that we are being oppressed, that somehow we have to have somebody that they consider white to come in and tell us that we're oppressed in order for us to be able to make a move. And that's what they... Part of what they rely on is that there are enough white people who will follow that kind of garbage and will liquidate the real question. But I don't think that's the case. Uh, and, but and, that and, is and, what happened. Yeah. If, if, if I could interject, because, you know, the timing of this interview um, is is ironic in the sense that. Again, I, I you know, I don't know if I as the host, you know, if I necessarily should be offering the government or the FBI advice, but. Perhaps while one of your own who was just outed by and large as a damn full-fledged Russian spy, they haven't called it that yet, but one of your own just was found out to be working with a high-level influencer for the Kremlin Suppose, represent one of your own, one of your own FBI agents. And look, I saw a couple of shows yesterday where FBI current ex FBI um, commentators commentators who were with the FBI, and man, they anguished and were sh claimed to be shocked and surprised about the collaboration between the representative the one who had a very senior level with the FBI who was working with the Russians. And my point is, and my unpaid, unsolicited suggestion to the FBI is had you paid more attention with, to those in your own ranks who ultimately were committing real espionage as opposed to blowing up and raiding these folks home and Give it terrorizing, being a terrorist to the Uhura, Uhura movement. Perhaps you could have discovered that skunk within your own ranks before. That's let my, me, un, that's my, yeah, un let, let me tell you, I think that's a really important kind of observation. One of the things that they are suggesting, I went to Moscow. I was invited to come to Moscow uh, by an NGO in Russia. Uh, that's called an anti-globalization movement. It was a, 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 a trip that was uh, to be accompanied by a lot of other people from different countries from around the world, uh, dealing with the question of self-determination of nations. And the question of self-determination is a critical question for us. And we've been pursuing this for ages. Um, I mean, the FBI cut its teeth uh, with the attack on Marcus Garvey you know, more than 100 years ago, who was organizing for self-determination. That's never gone away, despite all the efforts that they've made to destroy. And so that's the question. I went, and I went, and they paid for the trip. Uh, the in, This NGO, this uh, anti-globalization movement paid for the trip. So they said that's part of the evidence that they used, that the Russians paid for, the Russians, they say, uh, implicit in that is the Russian government. And they say they know the, that, that it was the Russian government because they, they imply that they, ha they have been able to penetrate the inner circles of the Russian government and that the person who they invited us, they say, and who is the head of this NGO, it works, for the, works for the Russian intelligence. That's what they said. Now, I don't have an intelligence organization. And perhaps this person who was working for the FBI at that time was the one who would have had that information, the one who just they've just claimed is working for the Russians. Perhaps he would have had that information. I don't know. But if they knew, then why the hell didn't they tell me that this was a Russian agent? I don't believe it, uh, by the way. Uh, I met a lot of people who, while I was there from various parts of the world who were contending with this whole question of self-determination. Some of them I didn't agree with and said it. 
Uh, but uh, the fact is, that's what it was about. And and if they knew, if they knew that there was some Russian agent that was in touch with us, why didn't they say it? Yeah, one, and, yeah, and if they knew that was a Russian agent, why didn't they treat the one, the FBI agent, that they just arrested the same way they treated us? Why did they come with a military force to attack? They weren't coming to arrest somebody they said they thought was involved in drug pushing or robbery or kidnapping or murder or mayhem or anything like that. They said that they thought I went to a meeting uh, that was paid for by the Russians. We organize elections, they said, was paid for by the Russians. So what in the hell is it about that that presupposes that they think that St. Petersburg, Florida, was St. Petersburg, Russia? That there was the GPS system so messed up that they, they thought that they were in Russia? No, they won't attack, attack Russia like that, but they attack the most impoverished sections of the African community, and it's precisely because we're working for black liberation. And if you saw the work that we were doing, this is really important. People need to come to St. Louis and see the Black Power Blueprint work that we've done. We're actually transforming black community where black people can now have something like jobs and housing and black people coming out of the prisons will be able to come and work in our work, a workforce program and then be able to be employed where black women are being uh, taught to be doulas. So in St. Louis in particular, where one out of where, where we have a situation where enough black babies die in the first year of life to fill 14 kindergarten classes. Why didn't they come and knock on the door and tell us that they want to block exactly what we're doing? Because everything that we succeed in providing for the black community shows the United States up for what it's not doing. Why would they attack? They say they're concerned Roe versus Wade. This is the Biden administration, et cetera, et cetera. Now we're making it possible for black babies to be born where they're supposed to be dying and they attack us for this. This is this is the real question. And it's a very racist trope that somehow somebody got to tell black people that we are being oppressed. Someone, someone, actually a relative, a, a relative was kind of annoyed with me and said, Uncle Rock, why do you always talk about race? You always talk about race. And what you just described there at the risk of sounding trite as to how, why they treated you the way they treated you and your organization versus how they treated the white guy that was, you know, in an executive position with them. It could have everything to do with that. He was a white guy and you have operated as a strong, black, fearless, independent, black man, black revolutionary. Amali, here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to regress a little bit because I, I typically say that I want people not just to be aware of what my guests might be doing now, but to get to know the guest, the, to get to know the person. And so I really would like you to do sort of a, somewhat of a Reader's Digest version of your biography, literally from being born, where you grew up, who you were influenced by at an early age, that will at least take us up to 1966 when you went in and yanked a mural, a racist trope of a mural um, off of a wall. But if you could give us that background and insight, please. Yeah, thank you. I was born in St. Petersburg, Florida. And Florida was one of those places that was kind of overlooked by much of uh, the civil rights movement and people who were interested in the civil rights movement. There was this image of Florida uh, being this very place of palm trees and sunshine and perhaps an alligator or two, uh, and just calm. But uh, it was one of the most repressive uh, uh, states in this country. I mean, it's uh, history abounds with atrocities committed against African people there. African people were brought into St. Petersburg, Florida, uh, precisely uh, to clear the swamps and things like that. And we cleared it, we paved the streets, we did all of that work. And St. Petersburg, Florida, because of the climate, uh, soon became uh, a, a location for, uh, for vacationing white people. It was a tourist attraction. And it was a tourist attraction that relied on cheap black labor uh, working uh, in the in the service industries and in the hotels, motels, and things like that, keeping them clean in the restaurants. That was what we were to do. We lived, we were restricted to a two-mile square area uh, where we would live. And this was by 
uh, by uh, the city, uh, the city's own uh, uh, code, and it, which only changed in something like 1960. So I grew up in those circumstances, and uh, uh, in the city, in the area that we grew up in, uh, I mean, the streets were generally unpaid, uh, and uh, we didn't. But I'm not saying this as somebody who, at the moment, was really felt like we were being, you know, in such trouble because it was a happy kind of uh, life for for especially young people. I mean, because that's the thing about youth, though. You can find yourself yeah. able to to love and enjoy everything that you're living in. So that- You can be, those, be poor, poor and oppressed and don't really know it. Yeah, and don't even, don't even really know it. You have to know something about the other side of it to get a sense of, of what it is that you're missing and uh, et cetera. So uh, that's how, how I, I grew up in those circumstances. I grew up in a situation where uh, I did have uh, some assumptions of horrors. I learned to read when I was literally in diapers. Um, I, I had an aunt uh, who, uh, who lived with us when I was a child and who taught me how to read. And she used the newspaper uh, as my textbook. And then, so we would be on the floor and she'd teach me how to read. So I had access to some parts of the world that I think many people did not, uh, and which is what made me bilingual in the sense that I spoke black talk and I spoke white talk because yeah. I learned how to read white talk, you know, very early. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the middle, in the sea of how, how we naturally talk, spoke to each other. So uh, uh, I was kind of conscious of, of some of those things. I left high school uh, in my last year uh, because, uh, in part because um, uh, there was a professor who was a very smart person and well-respected who made the statement that black people would never be free uh, until uh, uh, we uh, uh, learn how to please white people or something to that effect. And I found it really difficult. It was very difficult to deal with that and other things you know, happening at the time. And this kind of statement made it difficult for me to hang out there. So I, I joined the military. I joined the U.S. Army. Uh, and uh, and I'm, I'm assuming in part that part of my discomfort uh, uh, is because I'm living in this small city in Florida and that the army said, uh, join and see the world. And so I'm going to do that. And on the, on the train, literally on the train that was taking us to the induction center uh, uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, leaving St. Petersburg, Florida, I ran into the situation where uh, on the train, all of us GIs going off to join the army, and it was crowded. It was so crowded that people were, were actually standing on the train and standing in that, that area between the cars, et cetera. And, and I'm standing there with, uh, with uh, some other people going in. And, and this white guy standing next to me, his name was Sailor. I'll never forget it. And uh, I was 18, uh, 17 or 18. He said, 18, he said uh, you know, that's something I really hate. And I looked at this, this my friend, my compatriot who going with me to join the army. And I said, what's that? And then he pointed to an African whose name was Morgan, who was sitting next to a white woman. He says, a nigger sitting next to a white woman. What year was and this? This would have been 1959. Uh, 50, yes. uh, and so uh, that stunned me. I mean, it really stunned me, you know. Uh, uh, so I get into the. I go to the military. I was in Berlin when the Berlin Wall was created. I was there. I was in one of the first U.S. tanks to confront a U.S. a, a Russian military tank in a combat situation. I was there, and uh, uh, I was there when uh, when uh, the the big contest that happened was not between black people and Russian, but between black people who had come uh, from the United States to fight the Russians and what have you, uh, and the white guys who were also supposed to be there to fight the Russians. This is where most of the confrontation that I saw, and then I happened to be lucky enough because Berlin uh, was occupied by Russians, French, American, uh, and British troops uh, at the time. I was fortunate enough to be in a situation where, um, uh, must have been around 1960, uh, where we ran these, uh, these uh, 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 contests uh, uh, with uh, British troops. And this British uh, uh, officer well, came to the, the outfit that I was located in. It was a tank outfit. And he said uh, he had just got back from Congo. <laughs> 
And he said that, uh, and we had to use special bullets there uh, uh, because the the, the, uh, the regular bullets just bounced off their heads. He's talking about black people there. And he says that he looks straight at me. There are only about 10 Africans in the entire outfit. And he says that he looks straight at me. I'm being informed. I'm being educated about the world throughout this whole process, right? And so here I am freezing in these tanks. I've never been cold like this in my life. I'm coming from Florida. I'm in Berlin, Germany, in tanks facing Russians in combat in a combat situation. Uh, and that's what I was doing. So I leave Berlin uh, eventually, and I go back to, I'm, I'm, I'm now in Fort Benning, Georgia. And in Fort Benning, Georgia, uh, uh, I see all these soldiers who go to on, on, on pass on, on the weekend, they come back blooded. These are Africans being beaten by, by white people uh, in, there in, in, in Georgia, in Columbus, Georgia. And so I, I stay on the base most of the time. I get sent for, I get sent for by the sergeant major, which is the highest ranking non-commissioned officer in the, in the U.S. Army. He says that uh, this woman, this white woman who works at the snack bar at the, at the post exchange says that you're trying to hold our hand. And uh, I said, what are you talking about? And what it was is that this woman, she, when we purchased something from her, she didn't want my hand to touch her hand. She wanted to drop it so that she wouldn't touch a black hand. And I insisted by putting the money in her hand. So she reports me as trying to hold her hand. And this is the kind of confrontations that we're having at the same time, the civil rights movement is blowing up all around the country and in Georgia as well. Uh, and this is what helped to inform me so that by the time I forced them to let me, I wrote Kennedy a 13 page letter who was then the president, telling him that I had no reason to be in his army, uh, the way black people were treated in this country, and despite the fact that you won't understand Mr. Kennedy being, you know, born with a silver spoon in your mouth, et cetera, et cetera, they sent me to a psychiatrist. And uh, they sent me to two psychiatrists. <clears throat> and the second one they sent me to was a major uh, who was on the main post. And this guy says that, and when I talked to him, he said, there's nothing wrong with you, you're just a Garvey act. I didn't even know what the hell a Garveyite was. This is and, how, and, 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 and I'm sure Kennedy didn't didn't did, didn't respond to you. He was too busy well, banging Marilyn Monroe me. and a whole host of others. Right? Yeah, him and Marilyn and, and I, the rest. I digress. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't respond. Uh, but anyway, uh, they decided that I should be out of the army, which was fine with me because I had already retired, resigned anyway. Uh, and so uh, they put me on a truck, on the armed guard. Um, before they did that, they court-martialed me. They court-martialed me on four counts of stuff they said happened months ago because they were now going to they were gonna kick me out, but they wanted to be able to justify kicking me out, so they court-martialed me after they tell me they're going to kick me out. And so I said, fine, I, I represent myself. I, I, I had called all, of, all the black soldiers who were in that in that, uh, on that uh base uh, uh, as witnesses for me. And by the time I finished questioning all of the witnesses, uh, the, the states, the, the military's uh, case had been really contaminated because to convict me would have been convict all these black people. And so they found me not guilty. They put me on a truck uh, on the armed guard, took me at the end of the post and said, bye. And uh, so that, <clears throat> that, that happened in 1963 uh, when, they, uh, when they kicked me out. And from there on, you know, I was in motion. Yeah. So, man, oh man. Yes, uh, yeah. so I went to work, by the way. Move up. Let's, let's move up just just yes. just just three years from there where it was the mural incident, the mural incident where obviously I want my normal viewing audience, you know, to be aware of this trajectory trajectory. And I also want uh, my white viewers to stop the tape and to go back and explain what you just went through in the military. Yes. And you're designed and charged with and have agreed to support the United States in its mission. Yes. And you come, you, while you're in the military, experience those kinds of inhumane atrocities. Rock, rock. Yes. I'm in the military. I'm in Fort Benning, Georgia. 
the Cuban Missile Re uh, Crisis blows up. They send a convoy of troops from Fort Benning, Georgia to Florida, to Fort Patrick Air Force Base and around Cocoa area because they're scared of Cubans coming in today now, right? That's, that's yeah. the line. So I'm in this convoy. We go through a, a place in Palatka, Florida. We stop where everybody's going to eat lunch. Uh, uh, and when we get off and go into the restaurant in Palatka, Florida, the white woman says, uh, we don't serve your kind. I'm in the military. I'm in uniform. I'm going to protect them, right, uh, ostensibly from this, this pretend Cuban I invasion that's going to happen someday. So my officer, he says, don't worry about it. He tells me that. He says, go wait outside. We'll bring something to you. We'll bring you something to eat, right? And, and I am the bad guy in this case. And, and somehow the Russians had to tell me something was wrong with the conditions of black people in this country. It's an insult, and everybody should be insulted, including your white viewers. They should be insulted by this whole trope, this notion, and the fact that the United States government is trying to play you, white people, because there's an assumption that you will believe it because black people are supposed to be so stupid that we don't, we don't have enough sense to know that something is happening to us without the intervention of some foreign force, et cetera. So anyway, I just thought that's just one of the things. I mean, we could go on forever, as you yeah. know, as you can imagine, you know, yeah. with the kinds of incidents. So, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to move it up uh, yeah. uh, tonight. So, you know, that happened. Uh, right. We got out in 1963, you right. know, again, when Kennedy, you know, was 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 killed. Yes. Um, you come up, you know, past the time when um, when Malcolm X was 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 gunned down. Yes. And. And you, uh, in 1966, there's an incident with you, uh, uh, act of call, civil disobedience. I call it an act of conscience. Um, and O'Malley, if, if, if you would um, to be a little bit mindful of, and I, I feel your passion and your commitment to all that you're doing, but if, if and I've been instructed by my producer to make sure that I stay a little strength. bit back from the camera, and oh, back it, from the camera, okay, like a little bit all, okay. also. But um, yeah, tell us about the incident in 1966, uh, the mural that blacks were subjected to 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 see, and what you did about it. In 1966. Uh, I was organizing, I was a SNCC organizer in the city of St. Petersburg. In fact, we organized the first membership-based uh, SNCC organization in this country. And uh, hanging on the wall of the city of St. Petersburg, the seat of power there, was this uh, horrific uh, eight by 10 foot uh, mural that would characterize African people as ape-like uh, figures uh, that were playing banjos and musical instruments for whites on the beach. And uh, while this demonstrations that we were doing had been initiated because of the city uh, was receiving something like $50 million from the federal government uh, uh, to work in the city, the this, this St. Petersburg city uh, had decided they were going to spend that money beautifying downtown white St. Petersburg. And we were complaining that that money needs to be used to pay some streets and do something in the African community. And so, but the mural thing was something that that we knew uh, could grab the attention of black people. And we thought everybody, we thought this was gonna be a simple, easy victory. We complained, wrote letters to the mayor that the mural is horrible, it should come down. The mayor sent us something back saying that our minorities need to learn to be less sensitive, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I'm not a racist. In other words, we're leaving the mural up. So sound one of like the- go, Sound like the Florida governor today. The Florida governor today, but, uh, <laughs> and the Florida governor yesterday, you know? Yeah. So, so we went uh, uh, during this demonstration that we were marching from the black community and this old, this old uh, African woman, she threw on some house slippers and a robe and jumped in the march and followed us down the city hall. And we got to city hall as per usual, we stood on the steps, we we're making our speeches and things like that, complaining. And this old woman began to speak and uh, she used double negatives and, and split her verbs and stuff, didn't talk like good white folks talk and, she was surrounded by all these white reporters and cops, and then they all started laughing at her. And uh, it just incensed me. It just incensed me. And I turned on my heel and went into the city hall. 
and, uh, and, and snatched the mural down. Uh, one other young man uh, accompanied me in there, snatched the mural down. We marched out of the city hall. Uh, down the streets of St. Petersburg, down through downtown, saying we're taking this back to the black community so that people can see this. I was arrested, and along uh, eventually with four other people, five other people, and we were charged. Uh, I was uh, charged with 11 different offenses, and uh, including grand larceny, which was a felony. Uh, I was put on trial for a lot of that stuff, and uh, sometimes going to court you know, like near midnight and things like that. And uh, uh, I was sentenced to five years in prison uh, on the federal, on the, on the grand larceny charge. And uh, so that in a nutshell is, is what happened with that. And this was the first like direct action black power movement that happened in this country it happened there in St. Petersburg, Florida on December 29th, 1966. Uh, this was a sort of like the, uh, an opening salvo for the black power movement. That there had been direct action movements historically, especially by SNCC. Uh, but SNCC, as you know, is the organization that put the black power uh, slogan out into the world, slogan demand out into the world in this country. And, uh, and as member of, and SNCC is the one that came up with the black, the black Panther symbol in Lowndes County, Alabama in 1965, the Lowndes County Freedom Organization which was characterized as the Black Panther Party by the media. Uh, and so many of us used that Black Panther symbol even before the advent of the Oakland-based Black Panther Party for Self-Defense. So we marched from the Black Panther office in St. Petersburg, Florida, went down to the, to the city hall, and I snatched the mural down, and we, were, we, we went to trial because of that. And as I said, I, I spent five, I, I was sentenced to five years. I was in and out of prison uh, on appeal bond, uh, et cetera, beat the case, quote unquote, finally. And then they threw at me again on the same charge. And then they sentenced me to three years in prison for that. So that was part of the whole process that, and there was no Russians involved in this. You know, this was, we, we knew we were being hurt, offended, humiliated, oppressed, exploited, et cetera. You know, and that, that leads me right into uh, the next question here. And, and, and I'm gonna do it as I wrote it out. Um, is to ask a very direct question to a claim that the FBI made. So I'll ask you to respond to that claim by, by asking, were, were you ever directed, as it is said by the FBI in their claim, were you ever directed by the Russian? The, the 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 guy who you know they have the indictment for to write a petition to the United Nations alleging the U.S. had committed genocide against African people. I've never been directed by a Russian to do anything, and uh, the petition uh, surrounding the question of genocide in the United Nations, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the beginning of our practical involvement in that reparations demand happened in 1982 with that World Tribunal. But this, the example for us uh, came from the 1952 uh, We Charge Genocide claim that came from uh, Paul Robeson was involved in that. William Patterson actually went to the United Nations based on that. There's a history in our movement uh, of, of this since the, since the advent of the Genocide Convention, which was in 1948. That happened in 1948. Uh, by 1952, Black people were at the United Nations demanding that the United States be uh, uh, with genocide based on that convention. So no, the Russians did not direct us to do this. Uh, and I think it's really important. I want to go beyond that and say the notion that we took money from the Russian government is garbage. It's, it's uh, the person who you talk to who uh, 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 had some experience with this kind of stuff and characterized as DS, the whole charge, that notion that, that the Russians paid us to do anything is BS. That is to say, we never accepted a single penny from the Russian government. We uh, we work with the, uh, uh, the anti-globalization movement, which is an NGO. But I also want to say this. I think it's really important. 
because I was also invited to into Spain. I've spoken in Spain, uh, uh, paid for by a non-governmental organization in Spain that was close to the Spanish government and that had members of the United Nations participating in it. I spoke at Oxford. I've, I've been to Oxford University. They didn't pay for me to get there, but they wanted me to be there. And they explained they wanted me to be there precisely because of what it is that we represent and what they know that we believe in as African internationalists. So I have traveled all over. The, I was in Ireland. I spoke. I was in Ireland uh, in 1984 uh, uh, at the invitation of the Irish Republican Socialist Party. I convinced the Irish Republican Socialist Party to unite with black people in this struggle uh, for reparations and also to unite with us in, 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 in convincing the United States that it should ratify the, the convention on the uh, uh, punishment uh, uh, and prevention of the crime of genocide. So we did that, those kind of things we've done historically. And I could tell you more things that we've done. And the Irish Republican Socialist Party actually had a press conference where they said that they would not accept any money. This is when the British were their hardcore uh, 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 in, a, in obvious colonial fashion. They said they would ref refuse to accept any money uh, from Irish in the United States, who Irish people who did not unite with the struggle for black power and the demand uh, for reparation. And they said they would pursue uh, what we were talking about in terms of pushing uh, for the United States to ratify that convention. So the point is we were not paid uh, or directed by the Russians to do anything, by the Russian government in particular. And I want to be clear on that because we have worked with non-governmental organizations in the past. And, and uh, organizations that, like when we worked with Irish Republican Socialist Party, that was not working with, the, with Ireland, the government of, of Northern Ireland or the British or anything like that. We have worked with and had relationships because we, we were determined that the struggle for black people in this country should not be something functioning in isolation from the rest of the world. Uh, so that's my answer to that. Okay, but, and, and so for those who are unaware the Yohuru movement, what is your mission? What is your goal? Our goal is absolute, um, unequivocal uh, self-determination for black people in this country and around the world. We believe that the foundation of the existing social system uh, has, is the actual uh, attack on Africa, the capture of Africa that's result in me being here and uh, 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 create this whole social system. It's interesting that on December 15, Joseph Biden, uh, after summoning uh, some 49 uh, heads of state from Africa, as they were called, um, uh, in this contest, he's a, right now encountered with Russia and China for, for uh, influence in Africa. Uh, made the statement that uh, that he had to apologize uh, and recognize, acknowledge that the original sin in this country uh, was what happened to black people, what America has done to black people. He said that. And it's really interesting because that's something I've said often. And that's a, actually it's a it's a take on a comment by Karl Marx, who said that uh, this thing that he referred to as primitive accumulation, how capitalism first got started, he said. It came about as a consequence of turning Africa into a warren for the commercial hunting of black skins. And he talked about East India, what we, East uh, Indies, which is, you know, India right now. And he said, this is the foundation for everything. This is, this is Marx. And so here you got Biden, you know, quoting Marx, uh, speaking uh, to these African heads of states. And, and, uh, and I'm saying that it is real, that the, this is our philosophy, that the foundation of this whole social system that oppresses, represses, exploits everybody, everybody, not just black people, by the way, everybody in this country and most of the people around the world. And this is the basis for this ongoing, never ending war that you see America confronted with because colonialism is what was described by that statement by Marx, whether he intended it or not, colonialism. And that's what we see being confronted in places like Afghanistan, Venezuela, Cuba, uh, uh, all these places where people want to be free. And you got a situation that came into existence by suppressing and oppressing us all. That's how I got here. And black people did not decide four or 500 years ago that let's leave 
Africa and then go to America because we know that sooner or later they're going to be looking for some good boxers or some good basketball players or something to that effect. That's not how it happened. And black people uh, and, and the indigenous people who are here are the only people who didn't come here looking for a better way of life but lost a better way of life as having come here. And what we are, we are locked in a situation where, where black freedom is illegal. It has always been illegal. There's never been a time when we've been here where being free as black people was not illegal. So whether it was uh, Nat Turner, you know, Denmark Vesey, Marcus Garvey, even uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. They, they charged W.E. Du Bois for the very same offenses that they charged me with right now. Uh, and they broke W.E. Du Bois. They took his passport. They chased him out of the country and things like that. Look at what happened to Paul, uh, to Paul Robeson, you know, before the House Un-American Activities Committee. Look at what happened to everybody from Stoker Carmichael, H. Ralph Brown, Malcolm X, you know, you name it. Carl Hampton, Fred Hampton. Everybody who's trying to win the freedom of black people in this country, in this really sense of the world, pays a horrible price for doing it. Somebody asked Malcolm X, what is the wage of the struggle for freedom? And he said, death. And because he, and this was shortly before he died. So uh, this is the reality. And this is what, and here you have a situation where because of this growing contest now uh, that America finds itself in with Russia and China, uh, for influence uh, around the whole world. Uh, the, 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 the United States under Biden's administration has declared uh, that the big contest in the world today is between democracies and autocracies. And he's defined um, democracies to be the United States and everybody who's on its side, unfriendly to the United States, and autocracies being Russia, China, Venezuela, everybody who they are fighting with. But how are you going to make that claim based on the foundation of genocide, slavery, and then the fact that even today, you can't pick up a newspaper if they're still printing stuff about an African not being killed, not just by white people, which happens, but also by the police department. These are representatives of the government. That's the government that killed uh, uh, George Floyd. That, that was the government that did that, and it cleans up this act after the fact, but it doesn't stop the reality of the ongoing uh, consequence. So how do they deal with that? They deal with it by saying that anybody who says that America is oppressive is working for a foreign government, is working for the Russians. And so when they attack um, uh, our home, my home, my wife threatened her uh, at four, at five o'clock in the morning in St. Louis, they weren't attacking a black community. They were attacking Russia and Russians. This is the line that they have created. And we're not going to allow them to do it without fighting back in a very serious way. So you are in a situation currently where you and your comrades are anticipating an indictment. Any day. Any day now. And, you know, I find it a bit peculiar that it's taking this long because it seems to me that in and of itself, that is a form of terrorism. It is. Where every single day, it is you are waiting for the other shoe to drop. You you have to agonize over the other shoe dropping. It would seem as if that happens, that you then are uh, would be in what would be sort of the legal fight of your life. And for those who are watching this, who have an interest uh, in your plight and who might want to uh, support. And look, inevitably, there'll be people that might watch this and will be rooting for you to rot in prison. <laughs> but for those who would like to reach out to you and to your organization with any form of support, what is the best way for my viewing audience to uh to reach you to reach you your should go to should go to hands off uhuru that's u h u r u dot org hands off uhuru dot org and you can connect and it's important to do that because part of what's happening right now is the united states government will is taking so long because it would conflate this case with all the cases of people who climbed the wall at the capitol and everybody else who they are charging the fbi agent that you just mentioned and they would say that they would try to make it indistinguishable. We get caught up in that whole mix and that it's just America 
in a state of crisis and we're dealing with all the crisis, but black people have been treated this way for historically. So go to handsoffuhuru.org and indicate that you do support this and that you understand uh, that concentrated in the history and struggle of black people uh, is the oppression and exploitation of everybody in this country. And that includes all the people who just recently discovered uh, the weaponization of the FBI. You hear that discussion, that talk happening all the time, but it was weaponized when they were going at Malcolm Garvey, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, who they tried to force to commit suicide, Fred Hampton, all the other people who they've killed and, and harassed during this process. Hands off Uhuru.org. So to you, the listening audience, um, given that this is my first uh, virtual interview, it was, we chose to do this with the background being that uh, we may not be able to do this tomorrow or the next day That's if, right. in fact, an indictment does come. Um, I hope you appreciate the weight of this program, the what Omali has communicated, and look, Use it, feel free to use it to teach your children about the land in which they live. Yes. Dick Gregory used to lace his speeches with, we've got a big job. Recess is over. Folks, I think that what you've heard today is a clarion call to you to understand, to appreciate, and to respond to the reality that recess is over. I appreciate very much you watching The Rock Newman Show 2.0. And Omali, thank you so very much. And I look forward to uh, staying in touch. Thank you very much. And I want to appreciate your listeners and viewers. And, and uh, even if I do you know, happen to, uh, if the indictment falls and I'm in prison, I expect to see you there too, right? Not on the same circumstances, but, you know, we want to keep this discussion going. That's a promise. Thank you, brother. And Thank good you. Evening. Thank you.